Well, Merry Christmas. Isn't this just the best time of year? And, and since it is, I want you to have the best Christmas ever. I mean, why not, right? This is the only Christmas out in front of us, so why not make it a good one? Why not make it the best? And, and so as we go through Advent each week, uh, as we're lighting the candles and we're reminded about what the candles mean, I thought we could take those lessons and then apply them to our Christmas experience. Last week, we looked at hope and we said we should always hope for the best and live like the choices that we make affect tomorrow, that even no matter how old you are or at what stage of life you are at, we are always building a household. And as we go through this holiday season, we can share that hope with others, hopefully bring light into the lives of others through Christ. So our passage this Christmas is Isaiah chapter 9, because, well, it shows up a lot on Christmas cards, but the familiar part, unto us a child is born, that's right smack in the middle of a bunch of other verses, important verses that I think could help us have the best Christmas ever. It begins, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. Christmas is a no more gloom season, or at least it should be. You know, if, a, if an Uncle Scrooge or a Grinch tries to get in your face this holiday season, they try to ruin your Christmas, you just shake a finger at them and say, hey, no more gloom. <laughs> it says, in the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as the joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. You know, last week we highlighted a few parts of this passage, and we used the Christmas-sounding words, you know, like, have seen a great light, on them light has shone, you know, I can picture that on a Christmas card, right, with a, a darkened sky in the background and one bright star lighting everything up, that, that brilliant light cascading down on a manger. You can hear the angels singing, oh, holy night, right? The stars are brightly shining. This is the night of our dear Savior's birth. It's joyous, it's festive. Those, those happy lyrics, they, they, they fit right next to snow and jingle bells and Santa Claus. But what about the next verses? What about the passages that follow? You have multiplied the nation. They are glad when they divide the spoil. What's that about? It begins with gloom, but then we see light. That's good, we like that, those are good. But then verse 3 says, our nation is multiplied. How does that happen? How do nations get larger? Well, nations get larger either through marriage or war, right? Nations get larger through conquest. So which is it? Well, look at what it says later. Divide the spoil. Well, that's war, right? That's war language. So somehow after this light has shown, the people will be happy and it will be the same kind of happiness that comes when you win a war. And, and there's great treasure to, to divide and to share. And then verse 4 says, For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. <laughs> right? Yeah, you're, you're saying, Pastor David, I, I know why they leave these verses off the Christmas cards. The rod of the oppressor is broken. That, that's a good thing. That means no more, no more living under oppression. Still sounds warlike, though. And then it says, as the day of Midian. You know, last week we talked about the land that Jesus was born into. We said that it was the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And now we're getting some context clues about the mission of Jesus. The mission of this future king. What, what kind of message is he going to bring? Isaiah seems to be implying that the Messiah will fight a war 
but it'll be a war like with Midian. Who is Midian? Well, that story is in Judges chapter 7. It says, Then Gideon and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. So right now, Midian is the enemy, and their army is vast, maybe half a million soldiers. And this is typically how Midian won wars. They, they would do it through volume, just through sheer mass. Sure, they would take heavy losses, but that was the price they were willing to pay. If you have blood to spare, all you have to do is out-survive, outlast your enemy. Verse 12 says, The Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locust in abundance, and their camels were without number, as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. So, a lot of people, right? And Gideon's army is much smaller. He has maybe 30,000 soldiers. So, Gideon goes up the, the hill to talk to God, and God says, Gideon, your army is too big. If any of your men are scared and they want to leave, tell them to go ahead. And the next verse says, Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. Gideon's army just shrank to 10,000. And he has to use that to fight an, an army that the Bible records are without number, like, like locusts, like sand on the seashore. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue, as a dog laps, you shall set him by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. Next, God says, you still have too many. Take the men down to the river and allow them to get a drink. And if they lay down on their stomach with their face to the river, send them home. Gideon sends them home. And he's left with only 300. Against half a million. How are they going to fight? Here's the big plan. He divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars and torches inside the jars. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon breaks his jar, lights the torch, blows the horn. This causes the Midianites to get scared, and flee, and they run away. And as they're running away, they're fighting each other. They're killing each other. And Gideon's 300 men win the war. This is the victory. And this is the battle that Isaiah is referencing. And just think, if you had been a soldier for this battle, that you stayed, that you were picked, right? You didn't run away when you were first told that, you know, if you were scared, you could leave. And then the second test, you didn't lay on your belly at the river. You kneeled and you lifted the water up to you. You get to go on and fight this crazy bull torch battle. What a story you would have to tell. But what's even more amazing was this selection process. Why did God have these two criteria? And what does it have to do with the victory that Jesus is going to bring at Christmas? Well, let's look at these two choices. The first was telling everyone who was scared they could go home. Here's the only thing I find wrong with that statement. Everyone is scared, right? I mean, 22,000 may have returned home, but I think they were all scared. 
So what makes 10,000 stay? Well, it was their choice to stay. See, I bet a lot of soldiers felt obligated. They had a sense of national pride, duty, but they didn't want to be there. They wanted to be home. They wanted to be in their own beds. They wanted to be with their families. And even though 10,000 stayed, I think those 10,000, they still wanted those things too. And they were still scared. But the difference is, the 10,000 that stayed, they were committed to the cause, right? Because I would argue everybody is scared. It's war. I mean, the chances of surviving this battle was gonna be iffy. So everyone's scared. So those first 22,000 that left, it wasn't that they were more scared than those who stayed. It was just that the 10,000 that stayed were more committed to what they had all set out to do. For the ones who stayed, their commitment was more powerful than their fear. Because let's face it, any outcome where you don't know what's going to happen is scary. But for some, it can be way too much. And that's the entire reason they won't even try. I, you know, they say, I, you know what, I don't know how this is going to go, so I'm tapping out. I'm sure uh, this is a good thing, but you know, I, I just can't see how <laughs> this is all gonna resolve, so I quit. At the risk of being disappointed, because there's the possibility of failure, it's so much easier just to quit now before this goes any further. But when you feel called to something and you feel invested, then the possibility of success is far more powerful than the possibility of failure. Those are the people who stayed. They said, I am scared, but it's worth it to stay. It's ironic that we always attribute heroes with bravery, right? We always say that um, bravery somehow means heroes aren't scared. Well, of course heroes are scared. But the difference for a hero is they say, my personal safety is not as important as the mission. My personal safety is not as important as this thing that I am committed to. So even though his army wasn't big already, God still knew that not all the soldiers, right? Not all these men are in it. They're not all committed. And God doesn't want anybody who's only partially invested. He wanted winners on this team. He wanted people who were dedicated in their hearts to this cause. Next, God gets rid of the water drinkers. I always thought this one was weird. But that's only because... I've never been part of a platoon. I've never fought in a battle, and I don't understand what it takes. Why did Gideon keep the men who only got down on one knee to drink, who scooped the water up to their mouth? Because those men were committed to each other. How so? Well, Gideon's army is in a dry climate. They're marching to a battle. They have very little provisions. And when you get the chance to drink some water, of course you're gonna take it. And if you're a thirsty fella and you see water, you're gonna to wanna to run up and indulge yourself. So most of the men ran, they fell face down into the water, they drank the water with their face to the ground. But not everyone. The Bible records that 300 men stayed alert in their surroundings. That while most had their faces and their bodies down, 300 stood watch while the others drank. That first group that left, they placed their self above cause. They were more interested in their lives and their creature comforts, and when they were given the choice, they left. The second group is really no different because an opportunity 
again arises to indulge themselves and they take it. They took care of themselves. They got what was theirs. And maybe it felt refreshing, but it still came with a risk. Have you ever seen predators and prey at a watering hole? What's the rule? Don't take your eyes off your surroundings. The watering hole is a great place to find water. It's also a great place to find lunch or to be lunch. So indulgence comes with risk, not just in the animal world, but in the people world as well. I mean, think about any of our nation's celebrities, our wealthy, people who have everything, people who have said yes to everything the world offers. We've watched them destroy their lives. Gideon was taking a very tight-knit group into battle. So he needs to surround himself really with winners. And if you're on a team, people who are self-centered, they are not going to help you win. On the battlefield, when you have very limited resources, you need people who are going to look out for others. Gideon's battle is mentioned right before Jesus is mentioned in Isaiah 9. So it's got to be significant. This battle is somehow wrapped up in the Christmas story. How? Gideon takes 300 against half a million. Jesus takes 12 and changes the world. That's insane, right? Christianity is the largest religion in the world. 31% of religious people are Christian. And Jesus did it with 12. Yes, okay, but didn't Jesus say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God? How is Isaiah saying that he is somebody who went to war? Jesus didn't go to war. Sure he did. Ephesians 6 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Isaiah has just got finished talking about how light destroys darkness. And Jesus did just that. He came to wage a war against darkness. When Jesus chose his disciples, he chose like Gideon. Jesus' followers were like Gideon's 300. Jesus chose people who risked their safety. They sacrificed. They were not the most talented or the most strongest. They were not the people who had the most resources. Instead, Jesus finds 12 who are willing to risk it for the cause. Peter says in Matthew 19 that the 12 disciples had given up everything he says, we have given up everything, life and limb and treasure, to follow you. And when Jesus first called them, don't we think they were a little afraid? Of course they were. When the future is uncertain, everyone's afraid. But even though they were scared, they didn't allow that fear to control them. They didn't allow that fear to keep them from one day impacting the world. Jesus says in Matthew 16, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus' disciples joined him, and they marched off to war, just like Gideon's men. But then in Isaiah 9, there's one more verse about war. And it's the next one in verse 5. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood, will be burned as fuel for the fire. But wait, I mean, if we're going off to war, don't we need boots and garments for battle? Why are we burning those things? What kind of battle is this? What do you need uh, boots for? Marching, right? Stomping. Nancy Sinatra said these boots are made for walking all over you. In war, boots are a symbol of crushing of being victorious. But Isaiah says, no, we burn the boots, which means we don't need them to expand Jesus's kingdom. 
So it's not that kind of war. Second, it says we burn the garments that are rolled in blood. Gross. <laughs> and this is the verse that comes right before, for unto us a child is born. This one about bloody garments. We burn the bloody garments right before the Christmas story. So again, it has to be important. Well, in the Old Testament time, if your friend died in battle, you'd remove his garment, you'd roll it in his blood, and then you'd carry it back for the family. And that was the memento. This was the memory of the fallen. Today, our soldiers pass on dog tags or a folded flag, but then, back then, the way you remembered your fallen friends was their blood-stained garment. Friends and family members who fought, who gave their lives, that's how you remembered them. And Isaiah says, yeah, we burn those too. Why? Well, because those garments, even though they're tokens to help us remember those we love, they're also filled with pain. So that garment, it's not just a symbol of their life, it's also a symbol of their death. And it's a reminder of brokenness and heartache. That bloodied garment is a scar. And as long as it's in your home, your family carries that memory. You know, last week we said there's a lot of people who don't like the holidays. Well, death is a big reason for that. One of Joanna's friends lost her husband last week. Young man, father. He died between Thanksgiving and Christmas. That's a deep scar. That's a bloody garment that will be in that household for years to come. But see, Isaiah is trying to remind us of hope and the light that is to come. And he says, yes, this Messiah will go to war, but it'll only be with a handful of followers, and it won't even be a war with boots and blood, because the very next verse is the promise of a baby. And so if we're going to have the best Christmas ever, the brokenness that we carry, the scars of the past, they are thrown into the fire. Jesus lifts those burdens. And he says, I don't, I don't want you to worry about these anymore. Blood on the garments is a reminder that in the past, your enemy won. Your enemies took from you. Darkness took from you. And the baby comes and says, no more gloom. You burn those things. When Jesus comes into the world, he heals the world. And the things the world has done to you, the pain the world has caused, either from war or from death, they are burned. But what if it was you? What if it was you that caused the hurt? What if it was you that caused the trauma? What if it was you that caused the bloodshed? That blood that was spilled was because of you. It doesn't matter. With the baby at Christmas, our own mistakes, they are also thrown in the fire. You no longer carry the wounds that you have given to others by burning the reminders of war. We are being told that we are free. Jesus frees us. Christmas frees us. Isaiah says, no more need for bloodshed. Jesus saves. And it's the last line before the birth announcement. This helps us understand the Advent candle today. When you burn the boots, Isaiah says, you burn the idea that you crush your enemies. When you burn the garments, Isaiah says, you burn the memory that once you were crushed. Meaning, Christmas is not about victory. And it's not about defeat. In Jesus' kingdom, there is a third option. And it's our Advent candle. It's the option of peace. You and I are free. And we let those things go. We throw them into the fire. The best Christmas ever says there is peace. 
No more reminders of crushing your enemies and no more reminders of defeat. Isaiah says, throw them in the fire. In Christmas, there is peace because unto us a child is born. You are building a household of hope but also a household of peace. Not just at Christmas, but the whole year long. 2024, it's going to be here before you know it. Wouldn't you love a little more peace next year? Peace from all the busyness. Peace from all the chaos. Peace from all the division. Peace in your family. Peace from debt, peace from legal systems, peace from your health, peace in your career, peace from continuing to lose. Next year, right now, this Christmas, every day, invite Jesus into your anxiety. Invite him and his power and his light into your stress. Invite Christmas into your darkness. Burn the boots, burn the bloodstained garments, and declare no more gloom. No more gloom. Jesus is Lord. Jesus brings healing. Jesus brings hope. And Jesus brings peace. The best Christmas ever begins with peace. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these weeks of Advent because they tell a story perhaps not about a manger or shepherds or wise men, but about eternal, foundational things that you want us to build our life on hope, peace, joy, love, Christ. Each week as we walk through these reminders, let them be more than simple Christmas stories. Let them be more than just heartwarming sermons. Let them be more than just an hour of our day Let us remember to live the weeks of Advent each day, each hour of our lives. They are the things that Jesus taught us. Hope, peace, joy, love. May we live his teachings. This Christ child who grew to a man to be our Savior and King, who waged a war but not against flesh and blood, A man who showed us how to live with peace. A man who told us to love our enemies. A man who told us to love our neighbor as ourself. A man who told us to forgive seven times 70. A man who forgave those who crucified him. May we walk in peace this Christmas. May we have peace this Christmas. Amen. Well, I'm so glad you guys came out to worship with us this morning. Of course, I want to remind you that we're having uh, all kinds of Christmas events, and uh, we want you to be a part of it. Every week, we're going to have two uh, services on Sunday, one at 9.30 and 11. Of course, you're always invited. Uh, For those, we're going to have two services on Christmas Eve as well, but only one in the morning and one at night. They will be completely identical. So that means we'll have uh, worship, the same songs, the sermon, the same songs, and well, yes, we'll even have candlelight, both services as well. We want you to pick the option that works the best for your family. And then this weekend, we have our Christmas concert. So we have a Christmas choir concert. It's going to be on Saturday and Sunday. And again, it's exactly the same. Both are the same. We want you to pick the night that works the best for your family. Please invite your friends, invite your neighbors, Invite your card groups, invite your men's group, your women's group, invite everyone you can. We want to have this place full of people who are singing and loving 
the, just the, the, the joy, right? The joy of Christmas, the joy of the baby born. We love you guys. Have a great Christmas and we'll see you soon. Bye.